Hi there. My name is Aaron Landerman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech. And in a previous lecture of guitar amplification and effects, we talked about distortion pedals and overdrive pedals. And then I mentioned that later we would talk about fuzz pedals. So all of these kinds of pedals really are distortion pedals. For some reason, when they set up the Goldilocks structure, they decided that the amount of distortion in the middle would be called distortion, an extreme distortion would be called fuzz, and a more moderate distortion would be called overdrive. Who knows? Your mileage may vary. The overdrive and distortion circuits we looked at tended to use diodes as nonlinear elements. Fuzz circuits, on the other hand, typically use standard transistor amplifier configurations that are just pushed to their extremes, although there are exceptions, as we'll see later. There are some circuits called fuzz that use diodes. If you would like to hear some of the circuits that I'm talking about, I would highly recommend checking out some of the videos on the topic of fuzz by Rhett Schall and some videos on the topic by Josh Scott of JHS Pedals. I'd like to start by taking a look at what is arguably the most well-known fuzz circuit, namely the fuzz face. Now, I'm showing you the NPN version of the fuzz face. This is a later version. The more famous version is arguably the original PNP germanium version. But I want to start with the NPN version because this circuit is laid out the way that students are more commonly introduced to transistor circuits. This schematic was quite clearly originally from fuzzcentral.tripod.com, but tripod doesn't exist anymore. So now to have your fuzzy needs met, you can go to fuzzcentral.ssguitar.com. To start trying to get a handle on this circuit, let's first pretend that this 100K resistor isn't here. Well, then I basically have two transistors cascaded, and each of them is a common emitter amplifier. We have a DC blocking cap at the input and a DC blocking cap at the output. And we can consider these two resistors to be a single resistor by just combining these series resistors when initially analyzing the amplifier. And then we realize that, well, when we're thinking about the small signal flow, this battery is an AC ground. This resistor structure here, the fact that this is split, essentially means that it's acting as a standard passive volume control that's just set really low. So we have all of this gain, and then we chop some of this back out. And then we also have a standard volume control at the output. So the first transistor doesn't have any emitter degeneration. So the voltage gain is going to be the transconductance gain of the transistor times this 33K local load resistance. The second transistor is a bit more complicated. If the fuzz control is turned all the way up, then this emitter resistor is completely bypassed. And the gain of the second stage is going to be the transconductance of the transistor times this total collector resistance that's 8.2K plus 330 ohm. That's when the second stage has maximum gain. But as you start to turn the fuzz control down, you start to introduce some emitter degeneration into the circuit, and that results in the gain becoming lower. The gain of a common emitter amplifier with emitter degeneration is going to be the transconductance gain times the resistance at the collector over the transconductance gain times the resistance of the emitter plus one. Now notice that if the emitter resistance is zero, the gain is just the transconductance times this collector resistor as we discussed before. But if we have enough emitter degeneration, we can approximate this as just being the resistance at the collector divided by the resistance at the emitter. So let's round 330 to 300. That would give us a collector resistance of 8.5K. And 8.5K divided by 1K would give us 8.5. So when the fuzz control is all the way down, Q2 is giving us a gain of 8.5. But there's a complication. I started this analysis by saying, let's ignore this 100K resistor. But there's a 100K resistor. 
So the common emitter aspect of Q2 is taking the signal at the base and sending it out the collector with a big chunk of gain. But it also has a common collector aspect. Q2 will act as a voltage buffer, taking the small signal at the base and copying it at the emitter. And then this 100K resistor provides a feedback path back to the input of Q1. Now, common emitter amplifiers are inverting. So we have negative feedback from the output of Q1 at the collector to the input of Q1 at the base. And negative feedback lowers gain. But the fuzz control plays a role here. So let's first note that the 100K resistance is a lot bigger than 1K. So as far as the effect of what the fuzz pot is doing on Q2, as far as thinking about it as a common collector amplifier goes, let me just focus on the fuzz pot. Now, if the fuzz pot is turned all the way down, then this full 1K resistance is in play, and this forms a reasonable voltage buffer. But if the fuzz pot is turned all the way up, then the emitter here is actually grounded, so there's no feedback at all. Remember that our concept of a common collector amplifier being a voltage buffer is an approximation. The actual formula for the voltage gain is the transconductance times the emitter resistance over the transconductor times the emitter resistance plus one. And of course, if the term down here in the denominator is a lot bigger than one, then that term swamps the plus one, and these expressions cancel out, giving us something approximately one. But if RE is zero, you get zero. And so you're really morphing between these extremes. So that's a second way in which the fuzz control is controlling the overall gain. It controls the emitter degeneration on Q2, thinking about it as a common emitter amplifier, and it also controls the amount of feedback. Now, this kind of feedback is usually referred to as current mode feedback, although I often like to think about it as voltage feedback, where I think about this 100K forming a voltage divider with whatever the impedance of the pickup of your guitar is in parallel with the input impedance looking into the base of Q1, but I think I'm the only person who likes to think about it like that. This kind of structure is usually referred to as shunt series feedback. If you are interested in digging into this more, I highly recommend this website for ECE 3050 Analog Electronics by my colleague Marshall Leach. This course now goes under the name of ECE 3400, and if you're a Georgia Tech ECE student, I would highly recommend it. On Marshall's webpage, he has an excellent write-up here on the general theory of feedback amplifiers that goes through all sorts of weird, interesting stuff including the four types of feedback of the various series shunt, series shunt sort of combinations. And then he digs into these things called Mason signal flow graphs that handle a wide variety of crazy feedback topologies. He also has this document called Collection of Solve Negative Feedback Amplifier Problems. And this is incredibly thorough. Unfortunately, out of the five examples of shunt series feedback that Marshall analyzes in this document, the particular configuration of two BJTs we're looking at in the circuit is not one of them. Okay, let's try the Google machine. How about Wordle answer today? That's the most trending search. All right, anyway, let's do two BJT shunt series feedback and see what pops out. Okay, there's a bunch of stuff here. Ah, Rose Holman. This is a great school. Let's see what they have to say about it. So there's some variations here. Let's look at amplifier C. There's A, here's B, here's C. Oh, this is awfully close to what we have. We don't have an explicit RS in our circuit, but that would represent the output impedance of the pickup. We don't have an RX equivalent, but we do have RC1 and RC2, and we have RF and RE2. Great. 
So go to this website and check out this write-up. And um, there's a lot of good stuff here. Oh, they do talk about the biasing here. So the biasing for this kind of circuit is pretty complicated. Let's see. To make their notation match R's, you would want to set Rx to infinity. So then the term here, this VCC minus VBE over Rx term, would drop away. Interesting. Oh, an important detail about this kind of fuzz that I should mention is that this feedback structure essentially lowers the effective input impedance. It's generally expected that this circuit is going to interact with the output impedance of your pickup, and that's just part of the sound. This is actually a later version of the fuzz face that used NPN silicon transistors. The earlier version of the fuzz face, and probably the most well-renowned version, uses PNP germanium transistors. There may be slightly different values, but basically it's the same circuit, and you can write it just directly swapping the transistor types if you put the negative voltage supply at the top of the schematic. So people like to think of this as a positive ground circuit. And one thing you have to watch out for is that this is probably going to need its own power supply. It's not going to play nicely with most of your other pedals as far as powering goes. The main difference between germanium and silicon transistors is that germanium transistors have a lower typical drop across their base to emitter junction. They'll have a drop of something like 300 millivolts where a silicon will have a drop of something more like 650 or 700 millivolts. Germanium transistors can also be more problematic in the sense that they're leaky, although maybe that's important in the circuit in terms of how these diodes sound, who knows. And germanium diodes also tend to be more sensitive to temperature variations. I would strongly recommend that everybody go to the GeoFX website and check out this article called Technology of the Fuzz Face by R.G. Keen. This article talks quite a lot about the biasing scheme. And of course, the whole point of the fuzz face is that you push it to extremes so it can distort. And if you want to look at some graphs of how it distorts, I definitely recommend going to the ElectroSmash website. In addition to the usual excellent mathematical analysis that ElectroSmash is known for, the website provides some graphs of the asymmetrical clipping quality of the first stage, as well as the combined effect of the second stage. So the fuzz face is a classic two-transistor fuzz. There's also three-transistor fuzz circuits. The most well-known is probably the tone bender. And the tone bender is basically the two-transistor fuzz topology we just looked at, with a basic single transistor common emitter amplifier without any weird feedback stuck in front. Although they did put a capacitor here at the input. That's kind of weird. That's basically emulating the effect of using a pickup with higher interwinding capacitance. So that's going to result in lower treble frequencies going in. It probably sounded too sizzly without it. The tone bender isn't the only way to make a fuzz circuit out of three transistors. This is the Maestro FC1 fuzz tone, which to my knowledge is the first commercial fuzz circuit. And it just consists of three separate transistor stages without any feedback between the stages. The first is just a voltage buffer. It's an emitter follower. So this doesn't have the input impedance issues of the fuzz face. The next two stages are two common emitter amplifiers without any emitter degeneration. The attack control changes the biasing of the second stage and hence changes the gain of the second stage. This was used by Keith Richards on the Rolling Stone song, Satisfaction. I would like to wrap up this discussion of fuzz by talking about something that's a little bit confusing, and that's the Big Muff pedal. So there's actually two different versions of the Big Muff, one that uses four transistors and one that uses an op amp. And these are generally classified as fuzzes, but as you'll see in a second, when you look at the actual topology, these have more in common with the overdrive pedals that we looked at. This is a schematic of the op-amp version of the Big Muff created by Gottfried Divos. 
And the nonlinear stage of the circuit consists of an operational amplifier and a non-inverting configuration with back-to-back diodes in the feedback loop. This topology has more in common with the Marshall Blues Breaker overdrive pedal we looked at in a previous lecture than any of the transistor-based fuzzes that we've looked at so far. The most well-known Big Muff circuit is the four-transistor version. This particular schematic was created by Kit Ray, and it consists of four separate stages. There's an input stage and an output stage. There's a tone control right before the output stage, and the main nonlinearities are provided by the middle two stages. In this context, you can think of the BJTs as acting as extremely primitive, not very good op amps in an inverting configuration with, say, this 10K resistor and this 47K resistor forming the input resistance and the feedback resistance in the way you would have an op amp traditionally configured in an inverting amplifier style, except we have these back-to-back diodes in the feedback loop like in the blues breaker, except we have this capacitor here so the diodes don't mess up the biasing somehow. So this so-called fuzz circuit is really more like two overdrive circuits in series. Now, if you're not one of my Georgia Tech students, you can check out here, but if you are one of my Georgia Tech students, I would like you to log onto Canvas and you'll find a quiz called Fuzz Quiz, and your answer will be one of the names of the Beatles. So, I'm interested in your viewing habits of these lectures over the course of the semester, and I would like your honest opinion. I'm just going to collect some aggregate statistics. I'm not making any personal judgments here. So, which of the following statements most accurately describes the way you generally approach the lectures this semester? John, I eagerly watch them the day they're posted. Paul, I watch them within a couple of days after they were posted, sometimes watching a couple at a time. George, I'd wait for a few to pile up and then binge watch them at a convenient time. Ringo, I'd watch them all in a panic the night before the homework was due. So type John, Paul, George, or Ringo, depending on which seems most accurate on average. Again, I'm not making any personal judgments here. I just want to get a feel for things.